So the church is anti-science and it tortured scientists and anybody who dared question the church's iron grip on authority. Friends, that's phraseology and words I hear so often in conversations and I'm sure many of you guys have too. But look, is this really a fair representation of the church's history and relationship with men and women of science? Let's dig in. You know, it's, it's amazing what we can get stuck in our heads. You know, things and information that we accept blindly without any thought of actually doing a little bit of reading and some research and to see if such claims are either false or true or perhaps somewhere in between. And you know what, nowhere is this more evident than in the idea that, you know, science and faith are somewhat opposed to each other. <laughs> like I said, how often have you and I had conversations with friends and family the topic of faith and religion comes up, particularly how Catholicism was a suppressor of scientific achievements, etc. Or the idea that the popes throughout history, they, they made it their objective to destroy any advancement of modern scientific discoveries and to force society to remain in the dark ages or how the so-called scientific revolution was created by the great men of the Enlightenment who had freed Europe from the dark, backward clutches of the Catholic Church. And you know what, I, I was reading the other day from the popular British science writer John Gribbon, and I think he sums up this kind of mentality in a general way when he said, and I quote, he said, mainly the Protestant Reformation had freed Europe and England from the dead hand of the Catholic Church, end quote. You know, that kind of mentality. Friends, I find it extraordinary to realize just how fundamental Christianity was in establishing the scientific endeavors and how influential and supportive the church was in the advancement of modern science. The great scientific achievements of the 17th and 18th centuries in particular were a culmination of the scientific process that took place in the universities that were founded and staffed by the medieval church. And as we'll see a bit later on, the, the leading figures in the scientific method were either devout religious men or themselves there were a priest, a monk or indeed a bishop and I think even a cardinal. And you know what, they proved everybody the, the, the beneficial relationship between the scientific discoveries and faith. I mean, the Catechism of the Catholic Church is really quite clear where it states, and I quote again, Since God bestowed the light of reason on the human mind, God cannot deny himself, nor can truth contradict truth, and that methodological research in all branches of knowledge, provided it's carried out in a truly scientific manner and does not override the moral laws, can never conflict with faith because the things of this world and the things of faith, they derive from the same God." End quote. But friends, let's just go back for a moment to where all this really began. And you know, funny enough, it begins with the pursuit of knowing God through theology. And unfortunately, theology today has a bad rep because um, it's often associated with irrationality and dogmatism, thinking that's kind of stuck in the Middle Ages, for example. It's something that the modern atheists, like especially Dawkins, loves to try and, you know, constantly um, support this idea. And I mean, philosophers like Ludwig Feuerbach, John Locke, William Dapier, for example, these guys, they constantly criticize theology, and especially the writings of the medieval scholastics, like that of, say, St. Augustine or Thomas Aquinas, um, who are often presented in later historians' writings as being hostile to experimentalism, which is untrue. The church founded universities, which began in Christian Europe. They were the first to formulate and teach experimental methods. And you know, theology was not only the pursuit and the understanding of God, but what God had created, such as the natural world, which you and I interact with and see every single day. And so natural philosophy was born. 
And look at everybody, the uh, Western scientific achievements, they began with natural philosophy and theology, where scholars, again like say Thomas Aquinas and Saint Augustine, they made man appear more rational, you know, that the universe was open to inspection, that God and his work in nature, they are fully intelligible. And so the church began to found universities to focus man's attempt in, in pursuit of this knowledge. And it's fascinating, I mean, the first university was founded in Bologna in the year 1088, which was just before the very first crusade. So we're going back, right back to the 11th century. And next came um, Paris in 1150, Oxford in 1167, Cambridge in 1209, followed by Lisbon, Salamanca, Seville, Naples, Padua, Rome, Pisa, Moderna, Florence, Prague, Cologne, Leipzig, and even Sweden in 1477. And to look at many, many more besides, as we know. But all of this, friends, is contrary to the myth that the theologians of the Middle Ages were simply just more, were simply interested in reciting dried up church dogma, which of course was not true. Friends, for the, the purpose of this video and this little talk, I just want to give a, a flavor of just how extensive the list of Catholic scientists was in furthering the advancement of science, particularly throughout the Middle Ages. Because it's often associated with Nicholas Copernicus as being the beginning of the great scientific revolution that all of a sudden there was a massive explosion of scientific discoveries. But to suggest that, is to fail to see the massive list of predecessors that made it possible for Copernicus to make his discoveries in the first place. In actual fact, I mean, he was taught by, he was taught the, the fundamentals of the solar system by scholastic medieval professors. I mean, in fact, it, it wasn't necessarily a leap, but the next step in a, a kind of a long line of discoveries. And if you permit me, friends, I'd just like to give a couple of examples of those who are religious men, but who are also very serious in the pursuit of science. And I'm, and I'm, I'm particularly focusing obviously on the Middle Ages because that's where um, many of our, our late historians like to kind of pretend that the church stuck in the Middle Ages and wasn't interested at all in the scientific endeavors, which wasn't true. And the first guy I'm thinking of is uh, Robert Grosstest in the year 1168. And this guy was a bishop of England, in, bishop in England, I should say. And he, you know, he made massive discoveries in optics and physics. And interestingly enough, he was the first to realize that rainbows involved refracted light. And he was also quite interested in astronomy. And what was very cool is that he, he separated astronomy from astrology, which is a very important distinction. And he was also one of the first to place heavy emphasis on observation as the basis of all science. And then we have a guy like maybe Saint Albert the Great, uh, who was a theology professor in Paris, and again, who was also a bishop, a Catholic bishop, this time in Germany, uh, a man who made great advancements in the field of botany during the Middle Ages. And he also contributed, uh, contributed to the work of geography, astronomy, chemistry, and he was also, interestingly enough, a guy who challenged his students and colleagues to not simply accept classical wisdom of, say, the Greek philosophers, but to also seek reliable observations. And then we have a very, very famous guy called Roger Bacon. I'm sure many of you guys have heard of him. He's often identified as the first scientist. But this guy was also a Franciscan monk who did huge work in natural science and mathematics. And he examined the size and position of the planets. And he also had a great knowledge of glass, calendar reform, mirrors, magnifying glasses, even gunpowder. And interestingly enough, and probably more importantly, he also stressed empiricism as opposed to blindly accepting authority. And his work was very much sought after by Pope Clement IV. And then we have another very famous Franciscan called uh, William of Ockham, a man who anticipated Newton's law of motion because he proposed that once God had set the planets in motion, they will remain in motion because there was no friction to counter the motion in space. So really smart, intelligent guys. And then we have another bishop of Lisieux, this time in France, uh, called Nicole de Resme, who proved that the earth turned on its axis. So friends, look at you guys, you can see that here, instead of the kind of big explosion of the scientific revolution during the enlightenment, it was the opposite. I mean, that idea of the scientific revolution as an explosion of scientific discoveries was merely an invention by later historians. I mean, Copernicus 
built on what was already discovered by Catholic monks and priests and bishops, and like I said, even a cardinal. And see friends, now we can begin to see why Sir Isaac Newton once said, and I quote, If I have seen further, it's by standing on the shoulders of giants, end quote. <laughs> see friends, he realized that he would not have discovered what he discovered without the massive work done by the Catholic clergy in the Middle Ages and indeed beyond. I mean, even that the priests, many priests in the 17th, 18th and 19th centuries, um, they continue this great discovery of scientific uh, endeavours. I mean, think about priests like Nicholas Steno or even Gregor Mendel, who was often called uh, the father of gene genetics, who was an Augustinian friar. Or how about uh, the great Belgian priest father, um, George Lemaitre, a friend of Einstein, who coined the great theory of the Big Bang. And of course, look guys, the list goes on and on. And look, I haven't even touched on the huge multitude of devout Protestant clergy and Christians who dug very deep into the scientific endeavours. Friends, unfortunately, the, the, the myth that the church is opposed to science uh, originated, with, originated from severe anti-Catholic and anti-religious writers from the Enlightenment. And I'm particularly thinking of writers like Voltaire, Rousseau, uh, Russell, Locke, Hume and others all who claimed that God was now unnecessary. And as just as the 18th century philosophers invented a notion of the Dark Ages to discredit Christianity, these writers of the Enlightenment, they labelled their own era as being enlightened on the grounds that you know, religious darkness had now finally been expelled by secular humanism. It's a myth that's perpetuated by modern atheists, again, like Harris and Dawkins. I mean, some of the great scientists of the Enlightenment itself, like Robert Boyle, I mean, this guy also worked on Bible translations into non-Western languages. Indeed, even Isaac Newton wrote extensively on theological matters. So friends, as we can see, most of the great scientific endeavors and discoveries uh, from the Middle Ages right up to modern times were made by very devout Christian men. And look guys, this is a very, very rudimentary examination, but I hope guys you can begin to see that the pursuit of science primarily arose from the Catholic Church, from Catholic medieval Europe. I mean, the scholastic theologians and the Christian natural, natural philosophers, they realized that because God made the world, right, he gave us reason so we could discover the order of the natural world and indeed beyond. I mean, even the great uh, English mathematician, Alfred North Whitehead, um, he recognized that Christian theology was essential for the rise of science. Um, as he said, it, it came from medieval insistence on the rationality of God. I mean, even Rene Descartes, he, he justified his search for the laws of nature because he said, such laws must exist because God is perfect. And, you know, and as science continues to prove, even to this day, the universe functions according to rational rules and order. And God has given us the power of reason. So it's logically possible for us to discover these rules and these laws that have been established by God in the first place. I mean, even Albert Einstein, he once stated that the most incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it is comprehensible. I mean, that it can be understood. Guys, when you think about it, that's a miracle in itself. But I want to be clear. Yes, there were some conflicts between the church and some of the great scientists throughout the ages. And one that gets kind of thrown up the whole time is that of Galileo. Uh, again, unfortunately, it comes down to Voltaire. I mean, he said that Galileo was thrown into the dungeon by the evil inquisition because he claimed that the earth moved or that he discovered moons orbiting Jupiter. Guys, the man never spent a day in prison in his life. I mean, he was ordered to recant his work and was put on a house arrest, yes, but that was it. And he, he got into trouble, particularly because of his own ego and his arrogance. And again, it began with Copernicus, okay, who had a theory that the earth revolved around the sun, which is called heliocentrism. And Pope Clement VII, he invited German astronomers to the Vatican Gardens to give a lecture on trying to prove this theory that the Earth moved around the Sun. And you know, it was, it was interesting to note that during the Reformation, Martin Luther, he was very opposed to this idea that the Earth revolved around the Sun. 
but the Catholic Church wasn't. The Church wanted it proved first before they could give the seal of authority and approval for it. I mean, whereas Copernicus, he treated this as a theory, not fact, but Galileo didn't. He was a very zealous and kind of egotistical guy in one sense because he embraced it with great zeal in one sense. And this kind of drew criticism not only from the Church, but from his fellow scientists. But nonetheless, Galileo was asked to come to Rome by Pope Paul V and the Inquisition ordered Galileo not to publish his work until it was properly scientifically investigated. I mean, even Pope Urban VIII, he wanted more discussion on the scientific observations on the issue of heliocentrism. But Galileo, he, unfortunately, he, he began to gather lobby groups around him and he put huge pressure on the church to accept the, the theory that Copernicus put forth, even though Galileo couldn't himself prove it. And he unfortunately violated the Inquisition's ruling to not publish because he, he published his work in the year 1629. And as punishment for this, he was put into house arrest, but it was into a, a luxury five room suite at the Tuscan embassy. And he was given even a personal servant. And it was kind of sad to see, but Galileo kind of admitted later on that he went too far. He pushed too much his theory on people and the church. And the man remained deeply Christian up until his death at the age of 78. Friends, the Galileo affair is an unfortunate example of something being completely blown out of proportion. And it was done so particularly by the Protestant and humanist historians. Why? Well, to use it as a battering ram to discredit Catholicism. And unfortunately, it's again, it's an example, and it happens even to this day, of when either faith or science becomes way too political. When you have powerful groups and lobby groups and organizations, they abuse their power to enforce their beliefs and their theories on other people with compulsion. Friends, in conclusion to this little talk, Contrary to popular myth, science and Christianity are not enemies. The church is very clear on her teaching on this exact issue. The fact that science and faith are two aspects of, of the one truth. They cannot contradict each other. The church also teaches, and it's very clear, that reason is a gift from God, that nature is orderly and is intelligible. And this teaching is what made the scientific discoveries possible only in a Christian Europe. And to my Catholic brothers and sisters, guys, I hope you have discovered something new today and are now equipped with a little bit of knowledge of the truth of the church's history and relationship to science, and indeed is in many respects the founder of the modern scientific methods and many of its discoveries, and is therefore not opposed to science. In fact, Catholicism has always welcomed it and pushes for scientific discoveries.